So, let's go to Genesis chapter 20, 32, and we're going to read verses 22 through 31. Genesis 32, 22 through 31. We're talking about Jacob in this story. It says, and he, talking about Jacob, rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons, and he passed over the ford Jabbok. That is an area like in a river. So that was the name of the river, the Jabbok River. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had, or he sent over the things that he had in his possessions. And Jacob was left alone, and there he wrestled with a man. In this passage of Scripture, it says he wrestled with a man, he wrestled with an angel, he wrestled with God, okay? The idea is, is that he had a wrestling match with God. I want you to know that. He wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, this is meaning when God saw that he prevailed not against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. In other words, he touched his hip. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaking. God's saying, let me, let, let me go. This, this wrestling match needs to end. The day, a new day is dawning. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, your name. And he said, wherefore is it that you dost ask after my name? Why should you should know who I am, Jacob? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted, or he limped, upon his thigh. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help me, Lord God, to be just a simple vessel, Lord, that I would be able to speak forth your truth, Lord. I pray for the hearers that you would give them ears to hear, Lord God, and eyes to see. Lord, I pray that your truth, Lord, would sink deep down in each and every one of our hearts and spirit, man. Lord God, that we might rise up, that it might produce a harvest in our life, that the fruit of the truth would be produced in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, you know what? I, I titled this morning's message, Say Uncle. I don't know if that means anything to you or not. It's say uncle. Say uncle. Does that even mean anything? I don't, they don't, I don't even use that language anymore. Some of the people that are a little bit older are kind of smiling, you know. They, they know what we're talking about. You know, back in the day when I was growing up, if you had friends that were stronger than you or you had uncles or brothers that were stronger than you, that was the thing. They'd hold you down and they would twist your arm or, you know, give you a pepper belly or tickle you, maybe. Until, and they would say, say uncle. And you're like, no, I refuse to say uncle. And say uncle, I'm not going to stop till you say uncle. And then finally, worn out and defeated, you would yeah. whisper it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, all right, just as long as you know who the boss is. I actually had a nephew and a niece, and my nephew refused to call me uncle. I didn't really want to be called Uncle Matt, to be honest with you, but every now and then, when the time was right, I'd get him down and hold him down, and I'd give it, start working on that pepper belly on him, and I'd say, say, uncle, say, call me Uncle Maddie. I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to call him. He, I don't think he ever relented. Yeah, I mean, his belly was red, but he would not refuse. That's kind of what the story is with Jacob right here. He's not really wanting to say uncle, if you will. But uh, look, I want to remind you a little bit about last week. I didn't know this was going to kind of be a series. I'm going to get up there and I'm going to write on the board. Last week was a kind of an in-depth teaching, but I want to remind you of where we were. We talked a lot about the inner man, about the spirit and the soul of man. And I always use this little famous stick man figure that I started to work with. Uh, got from Brother Larson a long time ago. But, you know, usually... This is supposed to be Jesus, and, and we're on the inside. But what I, what I did last week was I kind of drew this right here. And what that was supposed to be was it described the inner man, and that's your spirit part of your man, and that's the soul 
of your man. And there's a difference between the two, but the two are actually make up the inner man. The word of God says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that the word of God is quick, that means alive, and it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. That it can divide asunder bone from marrow and soul from spirit. Now i got to tell you, being in healthcare, it's very difficult to extract bone marrow out of a person. The bone and the marrow itself actually equal up one unit. They are two separate entities, but they basically make up one. You can't have one functioning without the other. You know, I've heard it said before like this, that a wheel is made up of a tire and a rim. If you take one away, it's not really functioning properly as its unit. The inner man is made up of the spirit and the soul. And the main point that I made last week was, was that your spirit person in you is that which is going to live for an eternity. It's also that part of you that's either dead or alive unto God. Yeah. You know, when you're born of Adam in your first physical birth, you're born in sin like Adam. Are y'all cold? No? no. Y'all are okay? All right. It, when you're born of Adam, you're born in sin like your father Adam. People don't like to hear that. That's, that's the word of God. You were born with a sinful nature. That's why Jesus said man must be born again. Jesus said you can't see the, the kingdom of God. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless a man is born again. So when you're born again, you're born again spiritually. Your spirit man is born again. We talked about the fact that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Angels are spirits. Demon spirits are spirits. Man is a spirit encased in a physical body. But when you breathe your last breath here and you take your first breath there, wherever there is, you're going to live there for an eternity. Right. The second death in the book of Revelation is actually speaking of a spiritual death, and it describes separation from God. But you are an eternal being, and because of that, you're going to live forever. Your soul, though, is your individuality. Okay? You can, if you look the word up in the Greek, and I, I know I wrote this last day, if you were going to write it in Greek, you would write it. I'm sorry, you, you wouldn't write it like that. That's not the Greek alphabet. But if you were going to pronounce it the way that it's pronounced in the Greek language, that's how you would write it, suke. All right? And what I did last time was I kind of just did this little number there to make a point. Psyche. Because, see, what we're talking about here is we're talking about the part of man that does involve his mind. His mind, his will, his emotions. And the way that I described it to you last time was this, is that it's who you are, your individuality. Sabrina, uh, Matt, uh, you know, Vince, we all have a story. Everybody in here, right? Every last one of us in here have a story. And until we get saved, we're, our individuality is molded through external circumstances. Right, right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I'm yeah. telling you the truth. I ain't even preaching psychology. I'm preaching truth. Yes, yes. And I got to be honest with you. Psychology don't line up with the Word of God. Amen. You can't create some kind of psycho theology. I'm here to tell you what it breaks down to according to a biblical standpoint. Right, right. The world around you, which is falling in its nature, that's what the Word of God says. It grows thistle and thorn because of the fall. All creation groans, according to Romans chapter 8, waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. The whole creation is groaning and waiting for the day that you receive your final redemption. What does that mean, preacher? I thought I was already redeemed through the blood of a precious lamb. You were, and you received the down payment, the earnest of the Spirit, when you got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. But hallelujah, there's coming a day when even your decaying mortal body will will be Amen. redeemed Amen. and you will be clothed with a glorified body. Amen. That's going to be a beautiful Amen. day. And listen, all creation groans. Yeah. I believe personally that that's that before, if you weren't here before, before we got started, I believe personally in that song that they say, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. He says the universe declares your majesty. Yes. Amen. Yes, it does. And that whenever all those constellations are blinking in the sky, and that, I believe that's a light show. Yes. And, the, and the chorus of the angels, they're singing a song. Yes. And even the birds are chirping yes. in. Yes. Come on, help me out here. Because all of creation is singing a song, yes. a symphony unto God, whether you believe that or not. Jesus. 
Jesus. It doesn't matter to me because I'm convinced. Yeah. Yeah. God is real and he painted the sky. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And he's going to fold it up one day. That's yeah. what we read in yeah. Hebrews the other day. He's going to fold it up one day. Matter of fact, I got I to gotta get on the ball because we're going to have a little Hebrews teaching tonight just to let you know if you want to tune in on Facebook. He's going to fold up the earth like a garment and he's going to tuck it out of the way because he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. That's what the Amen. word of God says. Amen. You have a soul, though, and this fallen earth has tried to mold you into what you are before Christ. Mm. All your life circumstances, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Your family unit, right. whatever that looks like, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, is it important that I go, you know, I, I use myself as an example. I told him that the other day. I went and did a lecture. I did. I don't care anymore because you know what it is? It's glory to God. Yeah. I went and did a lecture, a pediatric lecture. I do it once a year. It's a little volunteer thing. I do it at Nickel State. A girl that I used to work with in ICU, she went back and got her doctorate. So I do that once a year for the, and I told her, I said, look, you, you, you bring me, you ain't paying me for this. When you bring me into the room, you bring Jesus in the room. Yeah. Now, I'm not here to preach. I get all that. And so I know I'm here to talk about, I know I'm here to talk about nursing and about pediatric, and that's fine, but, it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a deal. Like, I don't leave him outside the door, so it's going to come out. I'll try to be respectful, but it's going to come out. But at some point in time, we started talking about adolescence. And what we started talking about in adolescence is, is that, listen to me, there's a big old problem with depression out there. There's a big old problem with suicidality out, out there. And there's a whole lot of things in life that are bringing young people to the place where they are. And we ignore these things. Yeah. I'm not here to ignore them. I was the first, and look, mama's in the crowd, love you mama, and it ain't nothing on you. You know that, I love you. You're the best mom you could ever have. I'm telling you right now, my mama tried the best that she could. Father, you know what the biggest thing, and don't get all emotional on this, mom. The biggest, hardest thing my mom ever had to do for me, you want to know what it was? It's called, she learned it in a psychology thing, but you know what? It, it, it was just a remake of what the Bible would have said. Tough love. At some point in time, you, you got to shut the door, my friend. I don't know when to tell you when to get there. But, and, and she said, you can't live here, son. You can't live here anymore because I still got my daughter to raise. And it was the hardest thing she ever did. But I thank God that mama did yeah. that. Now, I thank God more than that that my sister had gotten saved about seven years before that. And it already started pouring seeds of the gospel into my life. Hallelujah. And when the time came in the midst of brokenness, I said, Uncle, yes, Lord. I give in. I surrender. Anyway, I was given this little lecture. And I was talking about adolescence because, look, my teenage years were a mess, my friend. I was a high school dropout by the time I was 16. I stole my daddy's car before that when I was 15. and I didn't tell them all this. But I ran away to California. But I did tell them about that one time, Mom. I don't know if you remember. Whenever I was doing something. I don't know. I'm embarrassed to even tell you what I was doing. <laughs> and Mama said that she had to call the authorities because we had to do something for Matt. And so anyway... I'm in class, and they call me up over the loudspeaker, Mr. Matthew Hebert, would you please come to the office? So I go down, this is in Lafayette High in Lafayette, Louisiana. I go to the office, I'm sitting in the principal's office, and all of a sudden two city, two, two or three detectives come in, I can see their badge, and immediately, what does Matt do? He tries to fight them. <laughs> it's, why do you think when you see the police you're supposed to like go fight them? But that's what I did. And I did. I told the nursing class. This, nurse practitioner class. I went viral. And before you know it, the end result of that deal was Matt with his old long hair getting drugged down the hallway in handcuffs. I did escape that though, by the way. <laughs> that's not important. We won't get into that. They left it. That's a crazy story. Within 45 minutes, I was back out on the street. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Point being is, is this, is that life has its way of molding you. Yeah. And my life circumstances had created a scenario. And, you know, the reason why was that part of it was it was that daddy, the way that daddy was, right? He, all the drinking that he did and as hard as he was. My dad, my dad loved me. I don't want to get into all that. But I know he had become hard from life. His people had raised him. All of his 
life scenario, the, the Marine in Korea, the football days when they didn't wear actual helmets and just wore a piece of leather. You know, life was tough. Men back then were tougher. You had to be able to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get it done. And then when you mixed up with alcohol and you just hard, then guess what it did? It, it perverted what was supposed to be something good and it turned it in to something bad. And then you take the friends that you start hanging around. I'm talking about your soul right now. I'm talking about how you ended up, and I'm spending more time on it than I should, but I'm trying to talk about how you ended up the way that you ended up before Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, um, the, the friends that you had. Yes. And, and the influence that they had on your life. And the choices that you made. You know, if you started drinking or you opened up doors to drugs or you got yourself involved in relationships, right? Amen. And not all relationships are as bad as some relationships. Uh, you know, and not some choices are as bad as other choices. But what I'm trying to say is that all these external circumstances are molding you and slowly shaping you and preparing your suke and developing your psyche, whatever you want to let, and creating an individuality. But once you get saved, Come on. all that's supposed to change. Amen. Amen. All that's supposed to change, and now you're supposed to be molded from an internal source because now the Holy Spirit lives in you, and the communication that the Spirit in you desires to receive is the Word of God. Amen. When I say supposed to be different, that's because not everybody allows God's will to take place in their life even after salvation. That's the truth. Sometimes people will never even open up the book to read for themselves. They're just looking for a preacher that will tell them what they want to hear. Well, guess what? The Word of God says in the end days that there's going to be doctrines of devils and that people are going to heap to themselves piles of preacher because they have itchy ears. It means, tell me something pleasant, preacher. Yeah. I want to hear you tell me something good. I want to leave out of this place feeling good about myself. But hold on a second. What you need, what I need, is the truth of the gospel and the Holy Spirit taking that truth and communicating it on the inside of us because God's desire is that he would begin to change our individuality from what we used to be to what he desires for us to be. I hope that makes sense to you this morning. Now maybe you know why you are the way you are. It's not what the psychiatrist told you. No, but, but listen, preacher, I'm doing pretty good for myself. Well, look, the only good thing that ever happened to me was Jesus. Yes. yes. I believe that's why God did what he did yes. in me. I was such a mess, I can't take no glory. People, when I tell people my story, somebody will be like, man, look what, look what you did. No, you, you done missed the whole point, buddy. Right. What I do, if it was up to me, I'd still be sitting on an air conditioner outside a convenience store in Lafayette waiting for somebody to get me high on marijuana. As ridiculous as that sounds, that's where I was until I bowed my knee to Jesus. And then God picked me up and he led me and he guided me. I'm just using myself as an example so that we would know that the God of glory, hallelujah, can change situations it, and circumstances. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to work on, on who we are yeah. on the inside. You know, one of the biggest things for me after God got rid of the alcohol and the drugs and the desire to go running around all the time and all that stuff. You know what he started showing me? You're full of pride, son. Mm -hmm. You're so full of arrogance. You think the whole world revolves around you. You're egocentric. This world doesn't isn't centered around you. What are you? I'm just telling you how God is speaking to me. What are you, a little two-year-old? You're a little toddler walking around here in your little stages of independence and thinking that this whole world revolves around you? No, you need a gut check, son. This world doesn't revolve around you. And many times we're still in that kind of a situation. We think the world, no, God wants to get us past that. Yes. God wants to cause us to mature and to grow up and to realize that he desires to use us in other people's lives. He desires for people to be able to be ministered to by us. But if we're so focused on ourselves that we can't see those that are hurting around us. And listen to me, I'm going to tell you another danger. Well, I'm just talking about me because I was a nurse. I became very hard before God broke me as a nurse. Yeah. Nurses aren't supposed to be hard. No, nurses are supposed to be filled with compassion. And I had become very hard with people dying, death and dying, always being around it. I worked in the ICU. I had become very hard. But God, when he broke me, he showed me. And you know what? We're supposed to be compassionate. 
you know, as a nurse, you're supposed to be compassionate, but as a Christian, you're supposed to be compassionate. Right. Amen. Amen. Because the reality of it is, is that you and I, if it wouldn't be for the grace of God, we wouldn't be where we are. Amen. That's right. That's right. And then the Lord help us if we become self-righteous in addition. Yeah, I might have problems, but I don't have their problems. No, that's relative righteousness, my friend. Right, right. The Word of God says that we're all guilty in Adam. The Word of God says we all need help. You know, listen, gossiping behind somebody's back just back is just as bad in the same line in one scripture in the New Testament as murderers. Amen. That's it. God's not okay with that. If we slander someone's name for the purpose of hurting them, whether we realize it or not, it is a lust of the flesh, and it is not the will of God. Anyway, I'm talking, I'm reviewing to you. About your inner man, the spirit versus the soul, your individuality. And today, though, the message is about Jacob. Say uncle. And the message has to do with the fact that, okay, so what my message last week was, will you follow the spirit or will you follow the flesh? Will you follow God's will, which is the spirit, or will you follow your will, which is the flesh? And I tried to make the difference between the two, that the flesh did not necessarily mean always lustful type tendencies, you know, like you think of sexuality or something. No, the flesh is just what you want. Right, right. In everyday situations and circumstances, will you do what you want versus what God wants? I'm talking about down to the detail. I used, I, I talked about purchases last week and everybody kind of got a laugh out of what I said. But the reality of it is, is this, even in purchases and the way the choices that we make, whether it's a new vehicle or a new house or whatever, are we living within our means? You see what I'm getting at? Like God cares about how we spend money. Are we living within our means? Are we being good stewards of the things that God has given us? Even down to that is what I'm trying to show you because I don't want you sitting there thinking, well, I ain't got a problem with doing drugs or drinking. You know, I but 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 every little aspect. The question is, are we following the lead of the Spirit? And listen, sometimes we miss it. Come on. Yes, yes. Are we following the lead of the Spirit? Well, the Spirit would say, man, I think you need to hold off on that purchase for a little bit longer. Just, you know, keep saving your money right now. All right? You can make a better decision down the road. Or will we follow out the flesh? And I preached a message about that a while back. I want what I want. I want it right now. I'm not going to wait. I want to be, I want my gratification to, to be right now. And so that's what we talked about. Will we follow the lead of the spirit, which is God's will, or will we follow the lead of our flesh, which is our will? Now, when we say uncle, now we're talking about Jacob. <clears throat> and we're talking about the person who refuses to follow the lead of the spirit, who instead wants to follow his own lead. He wants to walk according to the flesh. Amen. Uh, and, and, and so in the story of Jacob, we see the person who doesn't want to submit to God's way. <laughs> And the result is chaos, frustration, and fear. But God allows people to go through situations that will humble them. And he will bring them to a breaking point where they will hopefully finally submit to God's will because the alternative is rebellion and destruction. I believe that God wants to bless his people in many ways. Spiritually, financially, in relationships, at the same time, he will not share his glory with another. And if our will is in the way of his will, he will move it out of the way. And that brings me to my first point. And my first point is called the empty. Now, I want to just give you a little bit of background on Jacob. And I'll probably mention it a little bit later in my message. <laughs> but if you know the story of Jacob, you realize that this is literally where the nation of Israel came from. The first, we, before there ever was a nation, there was a man named Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And God said, come out from amongst your people and I will make you a great nation. And Abraham had a son named Isaac and Isaac had two sons. One was named Jacob and one was named Esau. They were twins. Jacob was the younger of the two. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel in our story. And from Jacob, his sons became the tribes of Israel. So that's where the name Israel comes from, and that's really kind of the big story of Jacob. So Jacob was Israel before there ever was an Israel, if you will. Now, along the way, what you got to know is, is this, is that Jacob, essentially, you could say he was, his soul man, his individuality was, he was a deceiver. We're going to get into it a little bit more as we go forward. 
But what I'm talking about is, listen, he stole, even whenever they were in the womb, the Bible says that when they were in the womb, that, they're, that they were struggling on the inside of the womb, the two twins. And that she, she was um, crying out to the Lord, what's going on? There's two nations in your womb, and they're at contention with one another. And even whenever they were born, Esau was born first. The Bible says, I'm just telling you what the Bible says, whenever Esau came out, and they pulled Esau all the way out. Jacob's arm came out with his leg. Because Jacob had a hold of his heel. Like, no, you know, you're not going to come out first. You need to get back in here. Wow. And that's what the word Jacob literally means is supplanter. Which means to take the place of another person. To take the place of another person through scheming or through doing or through by force. Jacob, even in the womb, according to what the word of God said, was trying to hold Esau back. See, God had a great plan for Jacob's life. He knew in advance that Esau was going to despise the things of God. He knew that Esau didn't, wasn't going to care about the things of God. And God's plan for Jacob always was that he would walk and, 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 and fulfill the plan that he had for him, which was that he would become the father of the nation of Israel. But you can't take matters into your own hands. You can't try to get ahead of God. You, you have to, as a child of God, learn to wait and to be patient on the Lord. On the Lord's timing and on the Lord's will. That's not always an easy thing to do. Just like his, his grandfather Abraham did. Abraham, God had a plan for his life, but Abraham stepped outside of God's will and took matters into his own hands and rushed into a situation, gave birth to Ishmael, and you do what you want with it, but we're still dealing with Islam today. The, the, the things that we manufacture in the flesh will not turn into something good. At some point in time in your life, it will come back to bite you. And so Jacob tried to prevent Esau from coming out. Later on, whenever uh, Isaac is about to die, Isaac tells Esau, go out there and kill me an animal and, and make me some of that stew. Like, uh, like his, the Bible says in his eyes he, were getting dim. He couldn't see properly anymore. He was going blind and also his senses were going out. But I want to go, get, go make me some of that stew and feed me some of that wild game and I'm going to bless you. Well, the mama overheard it, so he learned a little bit from his mama too. Mama overheard and said, look, I got a plan, son. While he's out there doing that, I'm going to go kill me one of them goats out there. And we're going to cook up some stew. We're going to trick him. And he said, then also get you a piece of that fur and put that on your arm. Make that a fur sleeve. And he, because see, Esau was real hairy. And so, and so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to trick the man. And it was enough. I guess he was old enough in his years that he didn't catch on. He ate, he ate the goat stew. He, he felt Jacob rubbing that first sleeve all over his daddy. And he turned around and he took the blessing that belonged to Esau. And he, he laid it upon Jacob. And then another time, Esau comes in from hunting, and he's famished, and he hasn't eaten. And Jacob's been over there stirring a pot, making a pot of lentils. And he ends up... Esau's starving, and, he's, and he said, okay, well, give me your birthright. See, it was God's will that Jacob would get the birthright, because the birthright had to do with the firstborn son, and the firstborn son and the lineage connected to God, because God had called Abraham to be a father of the nation of Israel. And all the promises were supposed to go, and God knew in advance that Esau wasn't going to do the right thing, and that it was going to later go to Jacob, because that was the plan that God had. But you're not supposed to outdo God. You're not supposed to figure it out in your own wisdom. You're supposed to hear it according to the word of the Lord, and to allow God to have his way, and to be patient, and to trust him in spite of what it is that you see. So I don't know what you're going through today. And yes, you are supposed to get up, and you are supposed to move. But you got to make sure you're not moving in a way that is contrary to this book right here. Yeah. Well, how am I supposed to learn the book? You got to open the book. Amen. You got to open the book, and you need to find a preacher that's going to tell you the truth about the book to begin with. Because you can be reading it, and if you don't understand it, you got a preacher telling you and twisting the scriptures in such a way that they're not really be, being presented the way that they're written, and you're not going to be growing in Christ. You're not going to be gaining understanding about the wisdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I need the wisdom of God to help me through daily life. 
Amen? So where we are right here is we're at the emptying. That's point number one, the emptying, right? So full of self, self needs to be empty. Verse 24 said, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. At this point in Jacob's story, he has made many selfish decisions. We just talked about them. And every Christian goes through a process where self has to stop running from God's will and face what God wants him to see in his own life. It's not about the person sitting next to you this morning. Amen? Yeah, but preacher, I'm telling you, they're way off. They're way worse than I am. But that's not, that's not about them this morning. It's about you and I. It's about us. And there comes a place in every person's life where we have to be able to see what God wants us to see. When a child of God continues to go in their own direction, God will chastise those whom he loves. God will create a scenario where the Christian will be alone with God. There will be no other way out, and we will be left to do business with God alone. I'm not talking about before a person is saved. I'm talking about afterwards. After salvation, but before surrender. I'm going to say that again. I'm talking about after salvation, but before surrender. Do you realize that there's a whole lot of people in the church that say that they're saved, but they haven't surrendered? And then, after we surrender, there's little bitty details that God's always revealing to us that need to be surrendered. He's concerned about every minute detail in your yes. life. Thank you, and because self doesn't want to surrender, God will get it solitary. He will bring you to a place where it will be just you and him. And for Jacob, it was on the other side of the Jabbok River. Which, check this out. Which fittingly means emptying. The Jabbok River where, where Jacob said, hey, take one wife and sin. We're not going to get into polygamy right now. But Trust me, I'll preach about it. If you want to talk to me after church, we can talk about it, okay? Take one wife and all those youngins and send them over there. Take the other wife and all them youngins and send them over there. Take all my stuff and split it up. Why? Because Esau is on the other side of that river. I haven't seen my brother in all these 21 years. And I know that he is a great and a mighty man. And he could have whooped me way back in the day. And I know that he wants to whoop me today. Take all my stuff. He's going to kill everybody. Maybe I might be able to get out of this situation with a little bit of something left. So he's still scheming. He's still trying to figure it out. He's not really willing to surrender. He's got his own plans, right? The best laid plans of mice and men. Lord, help us. And, and that's what Jacob is doing. Send him over there. But listen. It's a fitting meaning that the word means the emptying. Jabbok River means the emptying because the place where self will dies is the place where self is emptied out. A place where a spiritual purging takes place and results in death to self. You know what I'm most grateful for in my life? I mean, obviously that the Lord changed me. But, you know, I'm very grateful that I was that guy sitting outside a convenience store on an air conditioner waiting for somebody to come get me hot. I am grateful that I stole my daddy's car and ran away to California. I am thankful that they drug me down the hallway at Lafayette Hot in handcuffs. You know why? Because it wasn't that hard for me to figure out I had a problem, yeah. church. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a whole lot of people that don't think they have a problem. And they're just skating through life. And they're like, look, man, my bank account balances to the penny. And I got all my bills paid. I got crown molding in my, on my walls. I got leather in my car. Life is good. I got a degree. I got a, a couple of skins hanging on the wall. Everything's heading in the right. No, 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 no. Have you surrendered to the will of God? Because God has something bigger for you, Christian. It, listen, I'm talking about the word of God. You might find yourself sitting in a church, some big church somewhere where everybody's going to tell you what it is that you think you want to hear. But no, if you are a true child of God and the spirit of God lives in you, he wants to mold you. I don't want to get ahead of myself. He wants to mold you into a vessel that he can pour himself into and that he can pour himself out of. That is your purpose in life. Come to the place of death to self. Galatians 2 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. That's point number one, the emptying, emptying of self, amen, to have God produce in us his will for our lives. Point number two, will you grapple with God? Verse 25 said this, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, meaning when God saw that he couldn't overcome Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. That word grap that word wrestle literally means to grapple. If you look it up in the Hebrew, it means to get dusty. We're about to go to the dirt on this one. God is wrestling with Jacob, and the word of God says that God, when he saw he couldn't prevail. Don't let me get a hold of myself, but think about that one for a little bit. What do you mean? God couldn't whoop Jacob in a wrestling match? Well, hold on a second. I just think about a couple of other spots in the Bible. In Job, the Lord told Job, shall the one who is fighting against God instruct God? Or should it be that he should have to give answers to God? In Isaiah, the word of the Lord said this, the clay doesn't question the potter. Ultimately, the clay allows itself to be molded so that it can function as a vessel for the use that it was intended. In our story, it's not that God couldn't overcome Jacob. Jacob is a man. God is God. But God created you and I with a free will. And while he will wrestle with us and contend with us and chastise us, he will not transgress our free will. He will allow you, if that's what you choose to do, to continue to travel down the pathway that you have chosen, even if you're in rebellion to him. But listen to me, brothers and sisters, the repercussions will hurt. It'll be just like your uncle twisting your arm saying, say, uncle, will you submit? Will you surrender? That's all God's asking us to do is to submit and to surrender to his will. The next thing I wanted to bring to you was, bless me, God, and change my name. That's what Jacob said. He said this, I will not let you go except you bless me, verse 27. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no more be Jacob, but instead it shall be Israel. You know, I don't know for sure what kind of blessing Jacob was looking for. But God changed his character. If you study the concept of the meaning of the word name in the biblical languages, it, the, a name describes a person's character. When a person is born again or broken and humbled spiritually after being born again, their nature is changed. Their character is changed. You know, I, I, always, I, I, like, I like this right here. You know, there's a whole lot of meaning in this. I asked somebody to make this one comment. Know most of you know that I was going around preaching in different churches and I bring it with me and I realized there's a lot of meaning in that. Amen. You know, Adam, the old man, that's who you were when you were born in your mom, from your mom. Yeah. That's who you were in your first birth. That's what your nature was. You have a, you had a you have a sinful nature. Your sinful nature is what, ca what causes you when it's tempted by the enemy to go in a direction that's going to lead you down the wrong path. Whatever that is. Whatever it is that you do when the lights are off and nobody else knows about it. That's your character. That's what's going on. But I'm here to tell you, God has a different name for you. God has a different word for you. Now, the enemy of your soul will constantly try to remind you of who you are in Adam because he doesn't want Adam to die. Right. He doesn't want this whole tombstone effect to happen to Adam. He wants Adam to live. He wants the old man to stay alive. He wants him to stay resurrected. The enemy is a master at doing CPR on the old man. He wants Jacob, Jacob's name to stay the same. He doesn't want our character to change. I mean, sometimes simplest thing. I don't know how else to do it other than to use myself as an example. But I can remember something like this, too. One time I was about to go on vacation. And I know I'll tell y'all this, and when y'all get tired, if y'all want me to leave, I will. Okay, when y'all get tired of my story. Because I won't be nowhere where I ain't wanted. All right, but I can remember one time whenever I was, uh, I was, I was about to go on uh, vacation. And um, it was my last patient. We have like a little flag 
system, okay? It's not important what they all mean, but green means you need to see the patient, blue means you need to give them, a, give them their shots. So whenever the green flag's up, that means I need to go in and see the patient. When I come out, I put the, the green flag back and then I put the blue flag up. You need to give shots to the patient, all right? Well, I see all my patients. I look at this one door and look, I'd seen about 25 that afternoon. So I look at this door right here, the blue flag's up. Guess what? It's time to go get tested. So I grab my stuff. I'm like, hey, see y'all next week. I'm out. I'm halfway down. The, um, no, I'm in my car about to leave the parking garage. And the nurse calls up, um, you left the patient in room one. I'm like, no, the blue flag was up. Why was the blue flag? We forgot to put the right flag up there before you left. So here I am, I'm frustrated. I walk up the back hall and I can remember I threw my keys up on the desk <laughs> and I walk up in the room and I saw the patient and I'm like, and this time I didn't say bye. I'm just telling you, I'm just real. Okay, you, you get what you get with me. And then I walked out and you know, I got halfway down the hallway and the Lord said, I thought you loved me. And I thought you loved spending time with me and I thought you loved my grace flowing in your life and my mercy in your life. You say all these things. Well, if that's what you, if that's true, what you say, then you better. No, you can't. Where are you going, son? You're not done with your business for the for the day. And I knew what the Lord was telling me. Go back and make things right. You can't keep acting like that, Matt. You can't sit here and act like the world in the way that you used to be in that out of one side of your mouth and out of the other side of your mouth. Oh, by the way, Jesus is real good. No, God wants to change us. Yes. Amen. And, and listen to me, and he will if we'll let him. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we don't still mess up. Come on, don't feel all weird in your seat over there. <laughs> We're all a work in progress. As a matter of fact, I'll sing about a song. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> He's still working on me. Yeah. Right? You remember that little children's church song? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. Hey, boy, think about that now. Hold on a second. That's pretty profound. It took him one day. I, I don't know if you believe it or not, but I believe it. It took him one day to make Jupiter and Mars and the stars, and guess what? They listened. However you want to break it down and you think it's like an unscientific way to see it, that the sun rises and sets when he tells it to and the moon reflects the light of the sun and the stars twinkle, the ones that he tells them to twinkle and some of them are stationary and the constellations move in the sky. However you want to look at it, maybe I got my physics and my astronomy right, nevertheless, they obey him because he's the master of physics and his word calls atoms to come together and to obey and do what it is that he tells them to do. But little old Matt, he's still got to work on him. Yeah. What an amazing concept. Yeah. He's wanting to change your character, amen? The name Jacob means supplanter, to take another's place. All his life he was a deceiver, but God's plan was that he would be a prince. God changed his name from Jacob, deceiver, supplanter, to a prince of God, one who rules with God. I got good news for you, church. God's plan is that you will rule and reign with him. Turn to Revelation 5, 9, and 10 for me on the, on the screen. Listen, I'm going to share something with you real quick. You got to be careful. People don't, some people don't like my kind of preaching because... I want to keep you eternally minded. You know, I can remember one time whenever the Lord really got a hold of me and I was trying to talk to this old boy and he used to like to talk about quarterbacks and how high they could jump and I used to know all that stuff and had it memorized and now I just want to talk about Jesus. And I can remember him saying, you know, sometimes, Matt, I think people are so heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. Well, guess what? Can I tell you something else? You can also be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. Right? You can be so caught up in this world and, 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 and that you're not really looking at anything spiritually. i got to tell you something, that this is a temporary state of mind. That's it. That's 
I know I keep saying it, but I said it the other day, I think at the men's prayer breakfast, Ray, Leonard Ravenhill said this, that life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Mm -hmm. What you do here, that's the parable of the talents, my friend. Yeah. What, what, if you were faithful with a few things, you will be ruler over. There is coming a day when Jesus is going to return to this earth and he's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to rule and reign from physical Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And all the nations of the earth will come and pay homage to him. And I don't know exactly how it looks, but the way my brain works is, is that there's going to be some people that are going to make it through to the very end when Jesus comes back. Those people are going to still have mortal bodies. You and I, we either died for Christ or we were raptured out and we've received glorified bodies. Guess what? People with glorified bodies don't die but, and they don't reproduce. But people that have a mortal body, they still reproduce. Produce. And Jesus is coming back to this earth. It might sound like sci-fi to you, but I'm here to tell you it's going to happen. He's coming back to this earth. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. All the nations of the earth will come and pay homage to him. And those mortal beings on this earth, I would imagine, will be reproducing upon the earth. And there's coming a time at the end of that thousand-year reign where Satan will be loosed from the, from the bottomless pit for a short season. Why? To deceive again the nations. Why? Because it only makes sense if more people were born and they also had to hear the story of the great Redeemer, even though he will be on the earth at that time, even though he will be seated on the throne of David and you might be able to see him from afar. I don't know. And maybe he'll lift up his hands and you'll still see the nail scars. I don't know. But guess what? Nevertheless, those that are on the earth, those with glorified bodies will rule and reign with him according to the parable of talents, according to this scripture right here. This is after where everybody's in heaven. It says, they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by, the, by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Don't change that too quick. Look at this. There's a, there's a worship service going on in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And they're just, they're just giving glory and honor Hallelujah. to Jesus. And the reason that they're doing it was because earlier it said that John started to weep. And the reason that John was weeping was because nobody was worthy to open the book. But there was one that was worthy. And the reason that he was worthy was because he became man without sin to pay the penalty for man's sin by offering his sinless life in place. And through that, he redeemed us. It means to purchase someone back who was in the midst of slavery. You and I were born as slaves of Adam, but Jesus, hallelujah, was born as a man so that he could offer up his sinless life to redeem you and I back to God. And listen, there was a worship service. You redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Look at the next verse. And you have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I don't know if that is, I don't know what that makes you feel like. I mean, listen, you gotta think about that. Is it too far out? I called somebody the other day and I gave them some news about on my other job. I'm like, hey man, go get started. Money far out, dude. That's how you're Does that seem too far out to you? Does that seem too far out to you to believe that you're going to one day rule and reign with God? Mm. I'm here to tell you because, look, this is the thing. But, but I don't want to think that far in advance. I just, I just want, I'm just, I don't, I want to, I love this earth. Mm. I, I love, I love my life. Mm. I love my car. I love my house. I love that tree that I planted in the yard. <laughs> I love to watch it grow. I love the fruit. I, I, don't, I want to get married first. Uh -oh. I, I, want to, I want to have children first. Uh -oh. I, I, I want to have grandchildren first. Uh -huh. You know, when is it going to stop? Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. I'm not saying don't enjoy life. I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless you. I'm not saying God didn't paint the sky blue because the sky is blue. I'm not saying that he didn't put a rainbow in the sky for you to appreciate. What I'm trying to say is, is that if you are so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good, if you're so worried about the temporal and the temporary that you can't think about the eternal, you got a problem and you may never surrender to the will of God. That's, That's right. what I'm trying to say. Amen? Amen. He wants to change our name. Hallelujah. He wants to change our name. He wants to make us a vessel that we can be used for him. 
The last point. You ready for it to close this down? We're going to close it down. Now you get ready. Whoever's going to come play music, y'all can go ahead and, and head up here. Point number four. He looked different. He walked different. Verse 30 says this, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. You know what's interesting is I personally believe that this is where the word Peniel gland comes from, but we won't get into all that because there's a whole lot to that. <clears throat> Why? Because I have seen God. And I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose up upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. The word halted means to limp. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Did you know that your whole purpose on this life wasn't just to be a nurse practitioner or pastor or whatever the case. But no, your purpose on this life was to be a vessel for God. Your purpose on this life was to make a choice to reject or to receive Jesus. And then once you made the choice to accept Jesus, your purpose on this life was to be molded by the Holy Spirit. Like a potter does clay, preparing a vessel that could be used by God. I'm telling you the truth right now. I don't know how it sounds or how it feels, but I'm telling you the truth. That God's purpose for your life is bigger than just your, your, exi your existence. It, it transcends that. He wants to use you, and you're his workmanship. And he's molding you, and he's changing you. And he wants your walk to look different. I know that Jacob was limping. Like, what does that have to do with my walk looking different? Well, listen, after you're a Christian, your walk is supposed to change. You can't keep walking the same way you did before. Physically, Jacob's limp was noticeable. And it was a constant reminder of what God had done in that face-to-face -face encounter. Spiritually, many times there can be a memorable time and place in a believer's life where there was an encounter with God. A specific episode that left him forever changed. A place where he was where he was lowered and that it was better to limp than to strut. It was better to be humble than to be haughty. It was better to submit than to be superior. Jacob had a face to face with God and he was never the same. I don't know about you, but I can tell you this. I need to keep having face to faces with God. I need to be willing to humble myself in God's presence. I can assure you of this. I know I use a lot of words, sometimes too many. But one thing that I will tell you is this. He's trustworthy. You can trust your life in his hands. Amen. Let's humble ourselves and submit ourselves into the will of God. If you need prayer this morning, the altars are open. Let's worship him together. Amen.